Welcome to Democrats Discuss. This is our monthly series that brings you thought leaders in both Rhode Island and nationally to discuss local issues, national issues, and international issues. My name is Joe McNamara. I am the chairman of the Rhode Island Democratic Party and a state representative from District 19 in Warwick and Cranston. I'm very pleased today to have an outstanding guest, Senate President Teresa Piveweed. Senate President Piveweed was first elected in 1992 and represents Newport and Jamestown. And I may add, she serves and represents her constituents with uh, intelligence and distinction. Thank you, and Mr. as an outstanding leader in the state of Rhode Island. And before we start, uh, Madam President, I have to congratulate you on the award you received last Wednesday from Rhode Island Kids Count. Ladies and gentlemen, President Piva Weed has been involved in the development of right care for the past <laughs> 20 years. And due to her hard work, and the work of the Rhode Island General Assembly over that period of time, we currently have 97% of the children in Rhode Island covered by health care, one of the highest rankings in the United States. And Madam President, thank you for that work and for that dedication. And I know your ears were ringing Wednesday when uh, leaders from uh, across the state I uh, mentioned you as instrumental in that great program. Uh, Madam President, could we start off by talking a little bit about some of the accomplishments that the Senate had during the last session? Certainly. Uh, first of all, thank you for those very kind words and nice introduction. And I do want to mention that Kids Count Luncheon was so nice. Um, so often we as Rhode Islanders are so focused on what we don't do well or what we can even do better. So to be able to pause and reflect upon the great success uh, that our right care program has been and how many children are insured was a very, very important moment um, and one that I enjoy each year. And really to kind of lead into what our focus in the House and the Senate has been, the economy. Why is it important? It's important because the more children that have insurance, what we're really celebrating is having healthier children. Right. But also economically, it makes so much more sense. The healthier our children are, the more cost effective it is. The big example that we used to often give that you still hear is if you can teach a child how to use an inhaler, you save right. thousands of dollars in a trip to the emergency room as a result of an asthma attack. It's not necessarily just the big things, but the day-to-day -day health care of a child. So not only is it a great thing to do and something we can be proud of, but it's something that makes absolute economic sense um, for us as a state. So what did we do this session? Well, as you know, Joe, it was a busy session. We had a new governor. It was. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, having a Democrat. I know Governor Chafee turned Democrat, but really, <laughs> since Bruce Sunland, this is the first time right. we've had a Democratic governor. And while I had had the opportunity to work with her um, in her role as a general treasurer on pension reform, uh, really, it was a new day for the speaker, the governor, and I to have the opportunity to work together. And we took on some really strong challenges, mm. and uh, she demonstrated tremendous leadership, for example, on tackling the Medicaid costs. Mm -hmm. um, right out of the box, uh, she asked the speaker and I if we'd work together with her um, to reinvent Medicaid right. and brought the stakeholders to the table, which ultimately ended up in the budget and is, once again, like right here, not only going to save the state millions of dollars, but will also ultimately provide for better quality services and better delivery of services for all Rhode Islanders um, and avoid waste and abuse and within the system. So that was a huge initiative, I mm -hmm. think, that we took on this year um, and 
we will be continuing to address as we move forward. Some of the savings that are secured by that are short-term, as you know, some are long-term, and they're not all going to come out right on the money. I mean, we did the best we could to estimate right. 1.5 right. million will be right. saved from this initiative or 1 million, but the fact of the mil matter is millions of dollars will be saved, and that's really exciting. For the Senate, from opening day, um, I believe our focus began last year on workforce development. Mm -hmm. What we hear over and over and over from employers, big and small, is, I have jobs, I don't have the right people to fill them. And what we recognize over and over is that our institutions of higher education and our elementary education system need to respond better to the needs of the workforce. So we felt that education from beginning to end needed to be our priority. Your counterpart in my chamber, uh, Senator Hannah Gallo, has champion of full day K. <laughs> we love Hannah. She, she has gets it. she has fought tirelessly. Absolutely. And we still, when this year started, we're seven communities without all day kindergarten. And it there's study after study, business after business that demonstrates without uh, any leeway for doubt that if a child has the benefit of all day kindergarten, oh, it's they're just, going to succeed. It's so important. Even my own children going to kindergarten, and people in the Northeast especially, if you observe a kindergarten in the winter, you see the kids come in in the morning, they've all got these snow shoots, <laughs> snow suits on, they can barely bend over the boots. That's 15 minutes taking off the snow shoe, the snow suits, the boots, getting them back together. By the time you get them toileted and then the snack and everything else, the actual instruction time is so small. And uh, this is a huge, huge development that puts our children entering the first grade on an even playing field, and especially in communities that uh, are a little bit more impoverished. Very important, very important. A major, major accomplishment, Madam President. And I think really something the House, the Senate, and the Governor can all be proud of. And it makes sense. You know, I talked to so many working moms, too, that the kids would have two hours of instruction. They'd be all bundled up, as you say, then back on the bus oh. into a YMCA program or something else in the afternoon. It just, it was, it was not good. So we're not quite there yet. It hasn't been implemented, but we were able to have it in the budget, and we yeah. all agreed on it, and that was really important. The other thing was, uh, several years ago, uh, immediately after Pell School in Newport actually was approved, uh, we passed a construction moratorium on a building moratorium on the construction right. of our schools. And there were a lot of reasons for that, but among them was uh, we did not have a sound business plan for what the needs were in the cities and towns, what um, priorities should be going forward, and demonstrable principles for with the declining population in many of our communities when schools really should be closed, maybe torn down, and new ones built. I had the anecdotal experience from my community in Newport where we had uh, Joe Eva Gaines, who ha was a uh, profile in courage uh, in this issue, that worked for three school bonds and the first two had failed, mm -hmm. made the difficult decisions to close schools tore down a school and built a new school that was green, that has Great. smart boards in every class, that's wired, that the Super. children want to go to. Yep. And it's a model for the rest of the state. What we did this year that I'm so proud of is lift the moratorium, which Wonderful. is so important. But also, as part of that, we're requiring an inventory. And that inventory will allow us to know what the conditions of our schools are across the state. So when cities and towns plan, it, this school has a leaky roof, but this school just needs a paint job. Right. 
elected officials at the local level are going to be required, very much as we do with the TIP program, TIP with program. roads, yep. to make those decisions. It won't just be who's the most vocal neighborhood mm -hmm. or what seems to be the best. It will be required to be done based upon the needs. And I think that's exciting. It's exciting we got it lifted, too, because that means construction jobs. And perhaps most importantly to me, I believe that when kids go to school, they should go to a place that's safe and healthy and beautiful that they're going to want to learn. Absolutely. We're investing in education and less students are safe, secure, and healthy. All of that investment in education means nothing. Yeah. Basic needs have to be taken care of. And certainly our schools, having taught in an urban system and been an administrator for that's 37 years, uh, it's very difficult when you are in buildings that need maintenance, when the students and teachers are complaining about being cold. And I remember one school that I was teaching in, I'd have to keep a piece of cardboard in the closet to put under my desk. The floor would be so cold on a Monday morning just to have something to stand on to keep my feet from freezing. So, and especially when kids are coming from homes that from families that may be struggling. So mm -hmm. this is a huge, huge initiative and very important. I, I really think it's going to make a huge difference. And the Constitution really does delegate the General Assembly as responsible for the schoolhouses in our state. This is where we should be and what we should be doing. So it's something that I, I think I'm really proud of and I think will make a big difference for all the children in our state. As you know, we fully funded education. I just glanced at my notes. We actually increased education aid by $35.8 million. Which is great. It helps with, all of our local taxpayers. It, it makes a big difference that we've been able to do that commitment. Now, at the end of the year, the issue of charter schools came up, and it became contentious because many of us are not necessarily concerned about charter schools per se, but concerned about the funding mechanism, which is Absolutely. currently drawing down on traditional public schools. Um, and obviously there's some folks on both that think charter schools are the best thing since sliced bread and others that right. prefer we have no charter right. schools and some that think some charter schools are pretty good or and some aren't and just like our traditional public schools that's probably the case not all charter well, schools are created I know the governor has commissioned equal. a group to work that's on the funding formula exactly. and that's a big part of it and many of the people have, have mentioned that the public schools have these high cost special education students which charter schools may not have. So that adjustment in the funding formula uh, hopefully will resolve some of that conflict between public and charter schools in our communities. And to be honest, it was the charter schools themselves that really brought this to my attention at the end of last mm -hmm. year when they were concerned about the discussion that was going on. Some of them came forward and said, we recognize that, um, for example, school transportation costs um, for right. private schools is included in a per pupil cost. And we don't have that responsibility in a charter school. That's something that falls right. to a traditional public school. And so there are things like that, which one may refer to as low hanging fruit that really could be very easily um, separated yes. from the current way that we fund charter schools. And it will provide an opportunity for a more meaningful examination, um, on the other hand, of things such special education costs. And that being said, funding formula has been in place for five years. Right. It's a good opportunity to look at it. But the one thing that I... Um, have said repeatedly, and I've said this to the governor, and I know my folks have said it, and I know the House also had a very vocal group that said this as well. If you're going to preserve traditional public schools and charter schools, it will require budgetary commitment of additional dollars from us, right. um, unless you were to retroactively decrease the funding of the charter schools. Rough estimates could be anywhere around $10 million or so, because we've certainly taken, and please don't political fact check me in, <laughs> but I, certainly it's going to take at least that much, I believe, um, to really address the uh, inadequacies of inequalities that have um, been unintended consequences of the current forming, funding formula. Right. I think we can both agree 
that your zip code should, certainly shouldn't predict right. the quality of education. Madam President, you've also been a leader with post-secondary education, and we're talking about uh, funding formulas and funding post-secondary education. It is an area that has been somewhat neglected by uh, the Department of Education, and uh, I know that we've worked together on a piece of legislation yeah. that looks at the performance in terms of graduation rates at CCRI, Rhode Island College, and the University of Rhode Island. And I really have to give you a lot of credit. Initially, there was quite a bit of opposition, but <laughs> yourself and your staff sat down and brought on the college faculty, the students, and we built some consensus around this. And uh, could you just tell the viewers what the post-secondary performance funding legislation would do? Well, as you know, and thank you for um working together with me this session on this issue and next session next uh, semester next semester see yes, I'm, in the, semester. I'm in the school I'm in the school I'm in the school next session I'm sure that we will um, get it across the finish line but the great news is they've already started some of the har some of the yeah. parties have already started without the legislation looking at these what we found is um, when we looked at workforce development we saw this over and over again that something wasn't connecting mm -hmm. and what we saw was the most frustrating thing for a student was to graduate and not be able to get a job right here they pursued this dream and their parents have made all these sacrifices and they were graduating and there was no employment and in other cases, well, what we saw, I wrote down some of the stats. At CCRI, 3% of the full-time students um, had an associate's degree in two years, and about 12% a degree in three years. And 12, uh, th in three years, yes, 12% in three years. That's just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, we found similarly at RIC and URI, low numbers. At RIC, 15% of the full-time students completed a bachelor's degree in four years. Wow. And these things impacted their financial aid as well. Oh, absolutely. And it never it used to be you could go to college. I won't show our age, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. But we Madam used to President. be able, you used to be able to go to college and get a degree. Get a degree in anything and yes. you were gonna get a job and all that mattered is you got a degree. Right. Performance based funding is about taking a look at if the colleges and universities are responding to the needs of the working place. Now, around the country, it hasn't worked well on occasions because it's been used as a stick. Right. And it's forced the colleges to compete with each other, and they've lost funding if they didn't. What we were able to do, and Dr. Marie Ganim uh, from the legislative oh, staff wonderful. was just tremendous on this. By working with the college presidents, we've now set targets such as on-time graduation, um, degrees and certificates in fields that are in demand, and then left some more ambiguous criteria because each of our institutions have unique challenges, whether it's CCRI, right. Rhode Island College, or URI, for the presidents to help um, establish. In addition, what we added to that is, in Rhode Island, the, one of the things I found when we first I started researching this was, when they were adopting performance funding in other states, what they were doing was changing from a per pupil funding formula. Right. And we didn't have we it. Don't have a formula. <laughs> so this would it also, and this is a huge point, for the first time in the history of Rhode Island, we asked the secondary council to develop post secondary council a formula for the funding of higher ed. Huge by itself. Because right Very now quick. it's always based upon who the commissioner was, who the board of trustees, yep. the, you know, who the alumni was, who was in office. Maybe URI had a good year one year. Maybe Rhode Island College had a good year one year. Maybe uh, CCRI. It, it really varied. It, it, there was no statistical basis, or it wasn't based Absolutely. on the number of students or anything else. So that is very critical: is that we get a funding formula in place. And you know what? It will really help the college presidents 
students for their long-term planning. Absolutely. And, and the, most importantly, the students. A young student in my district came up to me and said, Representative McNamara, I don't think that paying for college should be the most difficult part of going to college. Mm -hmm. And when I explain this and how graduation on time decreases, not by 20 percent, but much more, because that fifth year at Rhode Island College, it's the 20000 that it costs you to go to school and live there, plus the 45000 that you're losing and not being employed. Right. So the real cost of that fifth year is $65,000. And we know that college affordability is just huge. Now, uh, Newport is, has to be the, I'm not going to say it's the capital of tourism in Rhode Island, but certainly close to it. When we mention when you're traveling out of state and you say Newport, Everyone knows what you're talking about. Last year, we had some innovative ideas and funding that came out for state tourism. Madam President, could you talk a little bit about that, especially in your perspective, representing Newport? Absolutely. Um, tourism is an issue I've been involved with since I walked in the front door of the State House. And it was a real natural, because Newport is, I would say, the capital of tourism. I'd say there's not many people that come to Rhode Island that don't try and spend a day in beautiful Newport. Um, but what has happened over the last 20 years is there's a beautiful airport in Warwick. There's tons of great hotels and water fires in Providence. There's the Blackstone Valley. There's the beaches of South County. That tourism has grown up around Newport. Mm -hmm. and. The days now, if you go someplace and you're staying in Providence, um, if I go on vacation, if something's 25 minutes away to 45 minutes away, I don't say I'm not going to go there. Of course I go there. You see everything in a state while you're in right. a state. So, but we've had different regional bureaus that have been doing their own individual marketing. And we have done some marketing of the entire package but not enough, and our state lacked a brand. There had been plans and proposals, many of them, quite frankly, in the past, to try and create statewide boards. And as is the nature of the beast, the local groups felt um, objected. And I was part and parcel of killing some of those initiatives, um, because Thank I was from honesty. Newport. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. I was from yeah. Newport. Why yeah. would I want to? Yeah, right. um, so, but that being said, we have a convention center in Providence. This year, uh, the governor took it on, and it was one of her couple of her major initiatives. And I think you know, there's a saying: when you're first elected, you should take on the hard issues. Mm -hmm. I give her a lot of credit for using those first couple months wisely, yes. because she really did use it to tackle an issue that for years has plagued us as Rhode Islanders. And we went to the local boards as a general assembly. We used the simplest of theories that all ships will rise Absolutely. if we work together. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, convinced our regional boards to take a shot at letting uh, the state takes some of the revenue to create a statewide brand. Um, it's still early in the initiative. They're still working together. Um, but I believe that it is in the best interest of the state. Rhode yeah. Island is too small. We've even delayed a little bit the license plate, um, yes. new license right. plate coming right. out. We can have a brand just like every other state does, one that can market. So when people come to Rhode Island, even if they're just bringing their student to see RISD or Brown or some, one of our great colleges. We have um, the first churches and wonderful religious things. We have great history throughout the state. People come sometimes just to tour forts and historic sites. I really have confidence and believe that if we do this correctly, um, we can really market the state as a whole and all of our regions will benefit. So it was a challenge. A lot of people were, a lot of the locals mm -hmm. were very nervous about it, and I'm not sure that they're completely sold on it yet.
but I have confidence that Stefan Pryor and his team is going to include them in the conversation because we have some really great bureaus out there doing some really right. great things and that um, on the whole that will move the state forward and really we look at the Volvo. We have the Volvo race. We've oh, it's had wonderful. such wonderful events here. There is no reason Fantastic. why we can't build on those successes and move the state forward. And speaking of building upon successes, Madam President, I know that you'll travel out of state and occasionally look at different models. Could you briefly touch upon the business in incubator that you observed in Cambridge and whether or not you think it would be possible to bring that concept into Rhode Island? Absolutely. Um, oh my gosh, I learned so much. I had never been to one of these innovation mm -hmm. centers. Now, of course, anyone who's under 25 is saying, what's wrong with her? But, <laughs> I, I, you know, I still thought you went to, like, a regular office all the time and did work. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, the Newport County Chamber of Commerce, hosted us uh, visiting Boston, and we went to two innovation centers. One was called a work bar and then the Cambridge Innovation Center, um, because we have a school in Newport as well um, that we're hoping to make the home of an innovation center together with some other initiatives. Uh, we have a federal grant from Commerce in the amount of $1.4 million oh, that's great. for an old Sheffield school. Not the whole thing will be an innovation. Some will be office space, but mm -hmm. uh, it'll be a good-sized uh, one. And then we have a company that's looking in Rhode Island at the M195 oh, wow. land, the wow. WEX, I'm going to say it wrong, but they're uh, looking uh, at that for an innovation center. It is a great opportunity because we have so many institutions of higher education here in Rhode Island, and we want to keep our students here. What it provides for them is a place where they can have access to office space, uh, Wi-Fi. It's almost like a small office. They, mm -hmm. they get a permit. They can have access to uh, each other, sometimes venture capitalists, lawyers as well. That is so important. I know as a, uh, an individual who started a small business, that initial phase where you're gearing up, there are so many different components to opening a business. You mentioned the legal and uh, also accounting, having so many people, they turn the key to that business, they don't know what their fixed costs are, they don't know what their variable costs are, and unless you have those basic business concepts down, you will not succeed. So I really uh, admire that forward thinking, oh. and you mentioned keeping our students, our graduates, our talented graduates, here in Rhode Island is so important. Uh, I would certainly love to see it in Newport and Providence. And Both Warwick. places, yeah. Warwick too, yeah. So, uh, and I know today I speak to young people that have business ideas, and if they just had that type of support, it would make all of the difference in the world. Even just having like a FedEx at the Cambridge, a place, a mail room, a place where oh, their yeah. mail comes, yeah. it, it was amazing. Some of the very simple things. And once again, it created an environment, a business environment. There was conference rooms that they could book. Yeah. So if they were meeting with a client, they, they could book a conference room. They had corner rooms on the different oh, that's, floors. That's wonderful. Now, before we wrap up, Madam President, uh, viewers might be asking, how can we get involved in the Senate and in the legislative process? Could you briefly describe that? Sure. I mean, the reality is um, we love for people to be involved. I believe the more people are involved, the more we have input from the public, and it keeps us real, and the more they understand that the five minutes they see us on the floor of the House of the Senate is such right. a small part of what right. we do. What I would urge people to do is to use the computers and log into our ca committees and our mm -hmm. calendars and come up to a committee meeting, mm -hmm. um, see what we do, uh, participate. If you're interested in a board of commission, don't hesitate to write your senator a rep, even if that particular oh, yeah. board of commission yeah. doesn't have a vacancy at this time. The next one might. Um, I, particularly when, I'm sure you said, Warwick, South County, Newport County, when we can find people that are willing to participate in these boards and commissions, yeah. we're thrilled. Well, Senate President Piva Weed, thank you very much for spending your time with us today, and uh, certainly we could go on and probably talk 
for another half hour. However, uh, we're going to have to wrap up uh, today's show. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to thank you for tuning in and remind you that democracy works when you are involved. It is an essential component to our government. Thank you and have a nice evening.